This morning with Alex Jensen on TBS EFM. So then, 8.19 in Saudi Arabia's historic elections early this month saw women vote and even win political positions for the first time. Some see this as a, a victory for growing democracy and gender rights, gender equality anyway. But critics would say this is more of a show for the outside world, that really fundamental changes need to take place before any sort of celebration can take place. In fact, some women boycotted this vote as a result of their concerns. We can bring in Ms. Azra Namani, Muslim feminist activist, renowned around the world for being so, an Indian-American journalist and women's rights activist, broadly speaking as well. Good morning to you from Seoul, South Korea. Oh, thank you so much for having me on with your listeners, Alex. Well, great to have you here. Um, so what, what are your overall thoughts on this election? I mean, it, would would you have been among those, for example, to have boycotted this vote had you been in a position to take part, or or do you see it at least as a partial victory? Well, I'm really honoured to speak to you all uh, in South Korea because, you know, I really think of South Korean culture a lot like my native culture in India as on the cutting edge of really challenging traditional ideas for women and gender and, you know, we, we have, um, in both of our countries, really uh, challenged ideas of honor also and what it means to um, be honorable in society and, and, you know, both cultures also being very shame-based. And so what I see happening with the government of Saudi Arabia and its efforts to uh, at least look good in the public eye is that they are really trying to save face. I mean, this is a country that is a theocratic democracy. Um, sorry, I almost said democracy. A theocratic dictatorship. Mm. Uh, you know, my stumble may actually be part of the, you know, sort of head games that the government is trying to put forward when it, you know, makes headlines that it's allowing women the right to vote and run for election. Because ultimately, it's a very superficial act. Women weren't even allowed to vote to the polling places themselves. They weren't allowed to go with their hair open in the wind because they have to cover them with those very black scarves and, and long gowns that they have to wear. They weren't allowed, if they were running from office, to speak to the male constituents. They had to have a male representative speak for them. And so what we still have in the country of Saudi Arabia is a system that a lot of us think of as gender apartheid. Mm. And I think I would have boycotted the vote, Alex, because ultimately almost good enough isn't good enough. Mm. Can you, before we get into the vote itself, can you tell us in a bit more detail some of the everyday challenges women face, this issue of guardianship uh, and, and various other aspects of society that would seem utterly shocking to women who sure. move around freely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, you know, the best way to also try to understand it is I know in, in South Korea people appreciate having a long view of history. And, you know, what happened in, in what's modern-day Saudi Arabia is that in the 18th century, this man named Abdul Ibn Wahhab created a very austere, strict interpretation of Islam on this philosophy called Salafism. And it was to hearken back to the first generations of Islam, of the people who were the companions of the Prophet Muhammad. They were called the Salaf. And so Ibn Wahhab created this ideology. Most of us know it as Wahhabism. But what it did is it took a very literal interpretation of the Quran. Mm. And so anybody who follows Christianity will know that Christianity has had to have an evolution with some passages in the Old Testament. And sadly, in the government of Saudi Arabia, they have stuck with very, very strict interpretations. So, for example, women are half the witness of a man, not only in Saudi Arabia, but unfortunately in other Muslim countries, and the majority of them. But what Saudi Arabia uniquely does is that it makes it that every woman has to cover her hair and her and her body with these long black shrouds. I went there on the pilgrimage to Mecca, and my mother took her scarf off for just a millisecond, and my young nephew was so afraid that the religious police was gonna, were going to come down and swat her with a cane. 
women are not allowed to move freely without a male chaperone that's either her husband, brother, uncle, or son. And, you know, my mother, she was uh, a grandmother there. My young nephew got hungry one afternoon, and my father was nowhere to be seen. Mm. So she literally went across the street from the Mecca Sheraton to the Kentucky Fried Chicken and ordered a meal to go because any moment then the religious police could have caught her and reprimanded her for traveling without my father as a chaperone. Women aren't allowed to drive. They are hardly allowed to run for elected office. Uh, The uh, actual sharia or interpretation of religious law doesn't allow any succession in the uh, control and power of the country for the women and the female lineage. And so when you think about South Africa, where where blacks were second-class citizens, that's the condition of women in Saudi Arabia. And uh, this has highlighted the the kind of paradox that we're seeing here by the fact that the women who stood in these uh, elections were not able to show their faces. It's it's quite an interesting situation um, from a from an experimental perspective, because there's, there's some criticism in the modern world that we're too swayed by good looks of certain politicians. But in this election, they had to do so purely on, on the basis of policies and, and whatever else they could use, because image didn't work in their favor. Yeah, it's a really interesting point that you make. You know, in, in, um, in the election, for example, nobody was allowed to have campaign posters so you don't have any, any of the iconography that comes with political campaigning. Um, women are allowed to show their faces when they go in public, but oftentimes have to veil themselves and definitely could not show their faces in front of male constituents. And, you know, in theory, you might think it's an interesting idea where it's not about your looks, but ultimately it's about something much more mm. um, negative. And well, that's yeah. about... The, yeah. Sadly, the for the wrong that reasons. A woman's honor has to be protected, and um, that her sexual her presence is such a sexual distraction to men that she has to be covered and and sequestered and subordinated. Do you and do you see this though? Thing is, I, I just want to okay. ask you because we're short of time. Do you see this as the yeah. beginning of of a victory though? Even if you would have boycotted this vote, do you think maybe in ten years' time or whatever period of of years to pass that that we might be seeing this as being a key turning point well alex i don't know and i i um wanted to just you know take this point of saudi arabia to the larger worry that is vexing our world and that is the issue of islamic extremism uh you know the rise of the islamic state i am convinced as a muslim who has uh grown up in this exportation of the saudi ideology to the world that the ideology of the Islamic State is the ideology of Saudi Arabia. And un- until that country and its neighboring nation of Qatar, which practices the same interpretation of Islam, until those two countries renounce this interpretation of Islam, women, no- non, uh, you know, just an- independent thinkers, atheists, Christians, um, anybody of any minority ideas are second class citizens in that society. Mm. And and I just, what I gently want to urge everybody to do is just think about, you know, look into our hearts and our conscience about whether, you know, we can support nations like that. And I, you know, launched a Saudi boycott petition and am honored to be part of this new initiative in the U.S. of Muslim leaders that are challenging the political Islam ideology right. of governments like Saudi Arabia. It's called the Muslim Reform Movement, and I invite people to come check it out on our Facebook page and our on our um, website, MuslimReformMovement.org. Okay, MuslimReformMovement.org. We have to leave it there. Yeah. I'll give out no, some more details you. in a few moments. Thank you very much.